Yes, welcome everybody. Welcome to A Mirror for Europe. Does democracy needs propaganda? My name is Mirte Vrees and I'm honored to be your moderator this evening. So tonight we will discuss the current image of Europe and its geopolitical relevance at a time when there is a war at Europe's bar borders. So how do we as Europeans perceive ourselves in this time of political crisis and how is the outside world looking at us? So how could or how should Europe represent itself and how important are symbols and images in order to create a feeling of unity? So does Europe maybe need propaganda? So this evening is a collaboration of the Bali and Institut Francais and we have a wonderful lineup. In the first half of the evening, I will talk with Rem Koolhaas, Ian Burema, and Luc van Middelaar, who is with us via Zoom. And we will really talk about this image of Europe uh, from the inside and from the outsider perspective and its geopolitical meaning. And later on, uh, I will be joined with Emmanuel Tiblou, Flavia Kleiner, Alice Twemlo, and Rem Koolhaas, and we will discuss how you actually shape you know, an image for Europe. What symbols do we need to represent the values of Europe? And is it possible for democracies to create symbols with emotional value? But first, I am really curious um, what comes up to your mind when I say an image of Europe. So Jolien, where are you? Yeah, so I'm very interested. Maybe you could raise your hand and there's no bad answer. Yeah, there behind there's a girl with the, like what is your first image when you have an image of Europe? Uh, but you sure you please wait for the mic. Oh, <laughs> hello. Um, yeah, okay, please wait for the mic so people at home can also hear you. <laughs> well, I would say the euro coin. You would the euro coin? Yeah, I guess okay. it's kind of an image of what Europe stands for. It started as an economic community. So I think it's very appropriate that a coin I think for someone from our generation is the first thing that springs to mind when you think about Europe. Well, that's very interesting, especially because later on we will talk about the image of the euro, coin and billiard. Um, yeah, someone else, an image of Europe. Please raise your hand, otherwise you will just get a mic under your nose. <laughs> yeah, there's a... Uh, the blue flag with the yellow stars. Yeah, yeah. So the flag, and does it um, does it have some meaning to you? This flag, does it appeal to you? Well, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's a symbol of um, united things, and mm -hmm. that's it. <laughs> All right. Maybe one last one. We have the coin. We have the flag. Yeah, you can just ask anyone. Now it's up to you. That's a very interesting question. <laughs> I think uh, I just think about the f the shape of the map of Europe in the um, the first flash that comes up to my mind. You see the map before you. Okay, well maybe after this program, I'm curious whether you have new images in your head. So without further ado, I will now would like to give the digital floor to uh, Luc van Middelaar, who will present us with a short lecture. Uh, Luc van Middelaar is a Dutch political philosopher, historian and professor of EU law at Leiden University. He writes columns for NC Handelsblad on Europe and geopolitics, and he joins us from Brussels. Welcome, Luc. Thank you, Mirta. Thank you. It's a pleasure to, to be with all of you. I'm very much looking forward to also hearing Ian Burema and Rem Koolhaas and exchanging uh, with them. Um, so I just want to offer some thoughts for uh, as, a, as a kickoff, right? Tonight seems to be about the link between Europe's image or iconog iconography and its place and actions on the world stage, and with the intuition being that there is some kind of link between these two. And I think that's true, that intuition is right, there is a deep link. Now it's funny that already the flag was mentioned, your flag, there you see it in its most simple manner, that although this flag is just a, a piece of cloth, basically, 
and yet it empowers an otherwise invisible abstract entity because it makes it visible, it, make, it, it represents it. And for that, it doesn't even have to have any meaning. The flag doesn't have to mean anything. It's just the fact that it brings it into life. But I'd say that this link between the, the, the image and geopolitical power goes much further. And that is precisely also what this geopolitical moment is about, because the European Union tries to enter its world of geopolitics to engage in a world of unpredictable events, hostile forces, so to say. And for that, it will need a stronger sense of what it is, of who we are. Uh, and therefore a self-image and also an image outside. And that for me is not just a matter of aesthetics or some cherry on the diplomatic cake. It is in the end really about survival. That's really important. Now about images, uh, nobody mentioned so far, although we can see here uh, the oldest image of Europe, the Phoenician princess raped by the bull god Zeus. Uh, way before Me Too days. So that's that's one image. And I think it's also important to look at images Europe has in the rest of the world, right? And for much, and Ian and others know perhaps more about this, but Europe, of course, is not seen as an innocent, uh, innocent princess in many places of the world. Uh, Europe was a continent which was very ambiguous in the people it sent uh, enslavers and liberators, uh, builders and destroyers, writers and talkers, uh, etc., setting in motion a whole chain of events. And that's why Europe is now stuck with an old self image, which no longer uh, helps for the world we are in. Because after the horrors of the Second World War, out of shame, out of pragmatism, never far away in the Netherlands either. Uh, Europe's and Europe's leaders fled history, fled politics, and only spoke the language of the economy, uh, the market, the euro, and the language of values and of a universal language of universal human rights for fear of national identities. Now, all this was very welcome, but it also meant that Europe's engagement with the rest of the world was no longer geopolitics, was no longer about power politics, but it was about trade, uh, human rights, promotion, and development aid. Europe was seen or saw itself, at least in, in Brussels, as kind of the vanguard, uh, moral vanguard on the way to, to global peace. Not just an actor among other actors of power among powers, but, but more a beacon. And even more so after 1989, when the wall came down and, and all of that, Europe was the end of history quite a self-image, and indeed, if you translate it into iconographic terms, this old self-image of Europe, you get precisely the banknotes, which uh, will be uh, discussed later. I just heard but uh, a, a view of our common history, which is completely bereft of any true uh, persons, uh, musicians, writers, as you can see, the national uh, banknotes, any true buildings, as was the idea, but only a uh, fictional Woods, uh, sorry, uh, fictional uh, bridges, windows, and 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 um, and doors. But now history is back. Huh? We we are, we can say it's past tense. If yes, it doesn't really matter. But history is back. We realize this, and some actors, geopolitical actors, knew this all along. And what do they tell us? I think that's also very interesting. What image do they have of Europe? Now, if you were uh, listening to Vladimir Putin, uh, the 9th of May, he sees Europe basically as, uh, as minions, uh, as vassals of the United States. Although um, he also, in not too long ago, referred to a shared Christian heritage, heritage of both Europe and Russia. Also interesting, kind of mirror. For Chinese President Xi Jinping, he likewise sees us basically as, as vessels of the United States, not as a power in, uh, in ourselves. But the Chinese president is much more polite, obviously, so he doesn't spell this out. And he likes to speak of uh, Europe and countries like Greece and Italy also as the, at the origin of Western civilization, as the counterpart of China, which is obviously for him the origin of Eastern civilization. 
in a way for US President Joe Biden and as for all his predecessors, except for Donald Trump probably, eh, America and Europe together are the West, the place uh, where we make life of, of uh, democracy and human rights. And that is also flattering in another way than what the mirror that Xi Jinping holds to us, this idea of, of values. But it's also a mirror into we, we can sometimes disappear as Europeans, because at the end of the day, and we also see this in this conflict with Russia, when it's about power politics, it is the US president who is our commander in chief. And we have a difficulty in defining ourselves who we are and what we are. And I think, nevertheless, that is very important if, as Europeans, we want to act, let's say, as power among powers, we need a stronger self-awareness of who we are. And of course, that, that can be still rooted in the idea of universal values, but it has to be more. We have to also speak about our place in time, our history, our place on the map, uh, which is one difference uh, with the United States, with which we share values, but we are in a completely different geographical situation. Now, the war in Ukraine obviously changes a lot, huh? the borderland, and it, re it forces us also to define ourselves in space and in time. A lot has been written about the European Union's huh? swift, determined response, uh, sanctions, help uh, for, 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 for Ukraine, for, for migrants, gas ban, oil ban, weapon deliveries, the peace project, Europe turning overnight into a military supplier. And also maybe just as strikingly, all these political decisions, I think, were upheld by an energized European public sphere. Uh, people demonstrating at public squares, helping refugees, willing to pay an economic price, uh, some even signing up to fight Putin and everybody uh, gratefully uh, voting for the Ukrainian song in, in Eurovision. So all, all this uh, translates into um, a relation to that situation. Now, the political decisions in this Ukraine crisis we could say build on a decade of, of, of crisis management, um, in, like in the Euro crisis, Brexit, a pandemic, and in all those moments of need, the European Union improvised, showed resilience, attracted the attention of the public and surprised sometimes itself, I noticed, uh, with what it was able to do. But now in this situation, the European Union and also people in Brussels, they want to do geopolitics. And that may be a little bit more difficult, uh, this perhaps for the discussion as well, than, than is sometimes imagined. Uh, doing geopolitics, in my view, power politics is not just adding another tool to the toolkit, it is really a shift of mindset for which um, it is about thinking in terms of power, interest, and also identity, history, culture, which is at odds with Brussels' self-image. So I think that will take time to amend these deficiencies. Uh, it's not enough to just call for a geopolitical commission or sovereign, sovereign Europe or words like that. Not even enough, maybe, to deliver weapons to Kiev. And to put it starkly, if you allow, an angel with a sword is still an angel. Right? And for Europe to enter that geopolitical stage, it will need a different political language to speak about itself, its place in the world, a different self-image, therefore, bringing in history, culture, civilization. Who are we defined, indeed, as the topic for tonight is, by being democracies. And that is also, of course, what President Zelensky uh, reminds us. He, like no one else, what I have seen in the past, in a way, 20 years, he mobilizes, he uses this relatively new European public sphere of all these people's realizing that we share a space, talking in fascinating series of speeches to national parliaments all across Europe appealing to our histories, some of which we had forgotten ourselves, like speaking about Den Briel uh, in the Tweede Kamer, and um, really staging Ukraine as a European nation. And that is a very powerful mirror which resonates. Maybe 
this triggers something beyond this specific moment. We, we can see, and I have a small test, my final sentence, Mirte. I found out the other day that indeed the European Central Bank is going to launch a redesign of these banknotes. So it will be interesting to see of this new awareness of geopolitics, the need for culture will translate into more interesting uh, banknotes with real buildings or real people uh, next time around. And that will be 2024. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Luc, for now. And we will definitely discuss um, the banknotes. But first, I really would like also to shortly introduce the man here at my table, Rem Kolhaas. He's a globally acclaimed Dutch architect known for his innovative and daring designs. He chairs the influential architecture bureau Oma Amo. And since 2001, he has initiated and realized multiple projects around the image of Europe. And on my left, Ian Burema is a Dutch author and journalist. Among other topics, he has written about democracy in crisis and the aftermath of the Second World War and the stereotypes about the Western world. Welcome. Um, Ian, to start with you, you are living in New York and you wrote a book, uh, Occidentalism. You focus really on how the East looks at the West. To start, just what is your personal image, view of Europe and has it changed since living abroad? Well, not really. I'm, an, I'm a European, so I, and I don't have an American image of Europe. But the American, first of all, we have to decide what, what we're talking about. There's Europe, which is a vague cultural concept. Mm -hmm. And then there's the EU. And, mo and most Americans, to the extent they're interested in the outside world at all, which is not very great, they have, some, they have a vague concept of Europe. But the, mm -hmm. the EU is very, very vague. I mean, people have no idea what the EU really is. And I would guess... As far as flags are concerned, probably more Americans would recognize the Dutch flag than the EU flag, and that's very, very few Americans indeed. <laughs> that already um, knew the Dutch flag. So, yeah. so there is, I don't think that they think of the EU. And in the, the mm. context of the Ukraine uh, crisis, mm. um, what strikes me is, is how much um, we're still uh, living in the shadow of World War II. Because what Europe represents in the EU in particular was never, never again war. Yeah. And there must be different ways to sort out human conflicts or conflicts of interests, uh, negotiation, trade, and so on and so forth. And when it comes to war, it tends to be the English-speaking countries who take the initiative and often very foolish wars. Um, but they're the ones who still have a memory of victory in World War II, whereas the continent of Europe, which is now the core of the EU, have memories of occupation and humiliation and so on. And you can still see this today. The, the, even the absurd Boris Johnson is um, taking a lot of political or getting a lot of political credit in the Ukraine specifically mm -hmm. for taking, being seen to be um, more in the forefront of real uh, defense of, uh, or military assistance to Ukraine than either Berlin or even Paris. And I think, and I'll stop here, I think that when we talk about the image of Europe from the outside, mm -hmm. the problem is there's no consensus about the image of Europe in the inside. Yeah. That what Macron wants to do and have a more independent Europe, a, a real European security um, posture and so on, is not necessarily what the current chancellor in Germany once. He comes from a tradition of appeasement and working together with the Soviet Union and peace and Be so on Before and so we forth. go to the how Europeans uh, see, see themselves, um, Luc van Middelaar said, like, um, well, it, it kind of changed how Putin looks at Europe, but now he sees them foremost as kind of the uh, helpers uh, of the US, uh, China also in a more polite way. Do you agree with, the, um, with Luc on this? Yes, because, and I think it, it reflects a certain truth, which is that, again, because of the never-again war attitude, which is entirely understandable, in many ways laudable, mm -hmm. but um, we in Europe have left our security very much up to the Americans. Yeah. And so we're dependent on the United States. And I think, rightly, somebody like Emmanuel Macron wants Europe to become more responsible for its own security. Yeah. But um, that's going to be very, very difficult. And until that has been achieved, we will still be dependent on the United States. Mm -hmm. And so the image from Russia or China or anywhere of the EU or the Europeans 
again, Britain is a little bit separate, yeah. and, and uh, Brexit is a disaster because for Europe to, def to, to become more responsible for its own security, it would have been much easier if the UK had still been inside the EU. Yeah. But um, the image is not entirely incorrect. We are still dependencies of the United States. Um, Rem Kohas, I just wanted to know, before we're going to talk about the current situation, um, I'd really like to know why, because you're already tw working for 20 years on the branding of Europe, like why this was so important to you? Um, it was important to me uh, because, of, because I'm a uh, European. <laughs> and because I felt that uh, too little was done about it, and I basically felt an urge to contribute uh, in, a, in a domain uh, that I can more or less uh, could contribute in. Yeah. But, um, but you have, you have um, one more question. You have I've then talked with so many people from Europe about what the image of Europe you know, is and was. So before this war started, what... What, where were you? <laughs> you know, where, what was the uh, uh, conclusion? Uh, well, I think that um, uh, what is very noticeable, and uh, the Ukraine war has uh, made it more explicit, is that there is a fundamental flaw in the architecture of Europe, uh, i.e. there is the European Union. Mm -hmm. It's an admirable uh, bureaucracy uh, with very intelligent uh, kind of people. It's not... Uh, huge, uh, and it is uh, actually amazing what it can do with relatively uh, modest means. But there is also 27 European nations yeah. that uh, don't want to uh, surrender their own identity, and that kind of want to give speeches to the parliament in Kiev, and that want to kind of go there and, and show their national uh, solidarity. And I think that the, the, there is a, therefore a constant uh, kind of undermining of the European uh, identity by the national governments that are united in the European Union. Yeah. And I think that is so fundamental and so difficult to overcome uh, that uh, as long as that is the kind of situation, uh, we, we have to be uh, actually impressed by how far Europe has come but regardless of this uh, kind of internal, internal problem. Yeah, because have you have you witnessed a real change since the war has started, or? Well, I think that we we can all witness a uh, change. Uh, I think that there's a kind of increase in kind of masculinity. There's a kind of return to belligerent uh, rhetoric. Uh, all the things that we were supposed to have overcome for forever. So yes, you you can see a lot of uh, kind of changes, uh, but they are visceral and in impulsive, and and I don't see a kind of overall uh, emergence of uh, kind of overall strategy. Yeah. And, and I would say, just to talk about this uh, kind of difference between what Europe is and the nation state, mm -hmm. we, we have a, a European president, Macron, uh, Ian already mentioned him, who has a kind of very intelligent vision for Europe, who is kind of uh, positioning himself to, to be able to uh, play a big role in that kind of transformation. And why do you find him, why do you... Uh, well, for, for the reason that I think that he has recognized that uh, Europe needs to be uh, more able to take care of its own uh, uh, security. Mm -hmm. I think that's the most, the most important one. I think that also he has uh, kind of recognized that uh, if we have to take every decision with unanimity uh, for 27 people, we'll, we'll never make any kind of important uh, kind of progress. So there's a number of kind of obvious uh, roadblocks that he hasn't identified, but uh, it, it's kind of impossible as a Dutch person to to align yourself with somebody like that because of the structure of the European Union. What do you mean with that? As a, you mean as an individual or as a Dutch person? Or well, I would love to to be able to vote for Macron. Mm -hmm. I would love to be able to be in a kind of situation that uh, instead of having a nail cliffhanger whether uh, Marie Le Pen or, or Macron will win, mm -hmm. uh, that we can kind of basically uh, find a way to connect to uh, larger politicians or that basically the 
the European, the politicians that represent Europe have a stronger say in the future of Europe. Mm, so almost an erasure of the nation state? At the expense of? Yeah. I, I think it's an kind of interesting experiment to see how far we could go. Well, I'm really curious, uh, Luke, if you could join us, uh, what your first reactions are to uh, what Ian and Rem are saying. Well, I think uh, both uh, identify uh, some of the, uh, of, of the key issues, and, and I agree with Rem that uh, Macron is a French president, but Rem interestingly called him also a European president, which yeah. he is, has a very interesting proposal. And he also thinks very clearly about these issues of, of identity, of, of who we are. He is not afraid to speak and use a word like civilization, mm. uh, which maybe in French is easier than in English, civilization, uh, because it, well, it has a little bit of a different connotation. Can I, I know this is an evening, you know, together with Institut Français, but you know, there's still this idea that the French still think they rule the world. Isn't this going a little back to the history of, you know, the French thinking? Not really. Well, maybe just, just one sentence, <laughs> what, what, what I think, is that, in fact, the French have not stopped to think about the world mm -hmm. and about economy or ideas or culture in terms of power. Yeah. And the rest of Europe did stop, and Why? especially in the Netherlands, but also in Germany, stopped to think of in what? terms of power and security. So basically, the French are better prepared mm. for the world we are now entering, and so they uh, bring more ideas. And they will have to be fine-tuned because some of these French ideas are really French ideas, but at its core, they have their own to something. And I think they, they in a way, they have a kind of memory still of, um, of that older world, which, which is very valuable at this moment. So well, the, yeah, French, yeah. the French and the British, yeah. which is why it would be so much better to have the UK inside the EU, because they are the only two countries that are serious about and, uh, security. And Ian, how do you think that Germany fits into this story of this? Well, the, the, whatever Macron wants and however we can support his goals, France can't do it without Germany. Yeah. Because Germany is by far the largest power in, in yeah. Europe. So one can only, and, and uh, uh, speaking as a Dutchman uh, growing up in the 1950s and 60s, it's sort of weird to be able to say, to say this, but we want Germany to be more powerful, take a more, a stronger military role, um, But we've seen uh, this, we've seen this change, you know. <laughs> we've seen this change, like this enormous increase in the military budget uh, by Germany. Well, not yet, was, we'll have to see. <laughs> the, there was speech of, do you, yeah, what, what do you think of this? Do you think Germany will really kind of change its, 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 its thinking, its policy on, on military issues? Well, the fact that the Greens are the main supporters of uh, a strong uh, defense um, of the Ukraine is very interesting and shows a real shift. Mm -hmm. Because the Greens were um, traditionally uh, a, a rather pacifist yeah. uh, um, party. Um, and they're the ones who are pushing the Social Democrats, who I think are probably divided, but are dragging their feet a little bit on this for reasons that possibly Rem uh, and I, uh, uh, I mean, just for the sake of l making this lively, we should perhaps disagree. Disagree. A bit. Yeah. Um, we can. You, might, <laughs> any time you might be more sympathetic to the Social Democrats in this instance than I, I am. I'm with the Greens on this. But this shows that things are changing, mm -hmm. but it will be a very slow process. And and one that's not entirely without risk. Again, I can say flippantly, I want Germany to be, um, uh, take a stronger military posture. Um, but, you know, one should be beware of what one wishes for. Well, what I think is a pity is that uh, all these decisions are now taken in the context of a crisis, uh, mm -hmm. even though Europe was kind of on its way before the war broke out, in terms of reassessing a number of its aims and in terms of also uh, developing a kind of emancipatory story about how it could uh, begin to control its own fate in a kind of more uh, emphatic way. And, and, and now it is kind of, is uh, Schultz uh, too much or too little, or are we sending enough weapons to the Ukraine or not? I think that the, the important issue is there was a tendency of emancipation uh, that uh, seemed to be kind of very promising. 
And uh, I think it's unfortunate that this uh, kind of war, which of course is, it, it's very unfortunate in any case, is interfering with that clarity that was emerging. Just from my understanding, do you mean with emancipation, kind of this awareness of its geopolitical role? With emancipation, uh, I, I really mean that uh, Europe needs to uh, kind of think about realistically, uh, realistically about where it is, where it's located, what mm -hmm. its neighbors are, what its friends can be, uh, what its relationships can be, and uh, what its communication should be uh, with the others. I've been kind of particularly uh, kind of interested, of course, in the last um, 30 years through my own work in communication with Russia, in communication with Kanwachana, in communication with the Arab world, in communication in Africa. And, and I kind of realized in all those worlds that there is an enormous eagerness to communicate with uh, Europe. Yeah. Also, that uh, maybe the Americans don't recognize the kind of European flag, but I'm sure that everyone in Africa recognizes it. Everyone in the Arab world recognizes it. Everyone in China recognizes it. So uh, I, I think that uh, with emancipation, I mean that or I hope that Europe is able to kind of simply behave more as an adult, less as a kind of dependent uh, on America and, and mm -hmm. develop these connections, uh, uh, continue to develop these connections. And one of the worst things I think of the war is the immediate eagerness to connect all the connections with Russia, with intellectual Russia, with, with uh, artistic Russia, with everybody, with, with Russia. And I think that's a kind of incredibly un-European or, or dumb thing to do because, you know, we, we don't benefit from disconnected uh, situation if you are in a complex situation as we are. Can I respond to that? Of course. Uh, I entirely agree with you that the, the anti-Russian prejudice and, and banning Russian music and so on is completely absurd. Um, but I think what perhaps is missing in this discussion is, is historical contingency. In the 1930s, or the, uh, the 20s, there was enormous communication with Germany on every level, uh, artistic and, and economic and so on. When things changed politically, and, and that could, uh, as things have done in, in Russia, and you have a crisis, it's not surprising, I think, that people start to um, uh, take a different position. And um, however sympathetic one can be towards Russian culture and Russians as, as a people, mm. Um, what Putin has done or is doing um, uh, surely affects the way that Europeans, uh, and not only Europeans, but Europeans react. And that seems to me uh, rational, just as uh, when Hitler came to power in 1933, that fundamentally changed the way that other people, other countries um, uh, dealt with Germany. But then I would like to go to Luke because I heard you in an interview on the radio also saying a little bit about that the European Union was also kind of fast, you thought, with their, uh, with their sanctions and their power talk and that they were kind of like, uh, how you say that? Uh, a young adolescent, you know, being kind of... Um, <laughs> In Dutch, we say out of the, out the bocht. Um, mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Out of the corner. Out of the, you know, they fell out of the corner. What, yeah, how would you respond to this behavior towards Russia by the EU? Well, I, I didn't think that, that the, the sanctions or those actions and countermeasures were, were, were too fast. I think that, that, that was absolutely correct. But I agree with, with, with Rem, and, and that what worried me a bit as well, that how Easily, we seem indeed to be seduced in this process also by the American storytelling, which is which is part of any American war or proxy war like this one, where Europeans were also immediately in the frame of purely good and evil. Mm -hmm. Which of okay, we obviously uh, we know who started the war. It is it, 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 it is it is. Putin, etc. But once you get into this frame of, of good and evil, uh, there is no place anymore to think about where we are, where we want, to, where we are on the map, where we want to be. Uh, indeed, um, how close we are to Russia, to Africa, to the Middle East, and which is not at all in the same position the United States are. And one example, and maybe that's what I what I 
I, 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 you refer to Milton is the, let's say, the ration, well, the, the speed with which um, the European Commission also offered uh, EU membership to, to Ukraine, yeah. Yeah. which is a, a moment of emotion. It's very uh, yeah. understandable. You want to give hope. But it was, to me, it seemed to lack any strategic credibility, a uh, country at war, and it seemed more like this will might very well be a fool's promise, mm -hmm. which is also a cynical uh, thing to do. So it is just that the European, one example of the European Union, which lacks the, the culture, strategic culture, to, th yeah. to think about these issues, and that was what I thought was a bit puberal, in a fa uh, as you said, uh, adolescent yeah. type yeah. Uh, behavior. So I want to now shift a little bit to the, the propaganda, uh, also in the title of this uh, program, because we need a new story, uh, story, story. And Ian, I uh, read this article by you in the Standard where you talk about China, Russia, and Israel, and the way they use uh, history as a propaganda tool to legit legitimize their policies. And I was wondering in what way, uh, I mean, you just said, Europe also always used this phrase like no more war, of course, but what kind of new narrative do we need um, in this kind of new position that we, we have now? Now we are not more apolitical. Well, I'm not so sure. I find it easier to um, think of ways not to do it. Okay. And, and I what I said, I think, what I was trying to do in that article, I think, was comparing that some countries have a, all countries use mm -hmm. history to make political um, points or propaganda, if yeah. you like. And there, is, there are countries who use a sense of triumphalism yeah. to do that, and the United States would be a good example, and in some ways, Britain as well. Um, what I find, and, and that has its dangers, and one of the dangers we've seen in, in the post-war period where the United States embarked on far too many foolish wars, thinking that they were going to be Churchill and Roosevelt again, yeah. followed usually by Britain as, as, a, as a loyal lapdog with their own delusions of grandeur. That is a, a, a danger. Mm -hmm. My argument was that the um, historical narratives based on um, um, historical... Um, resentment, victimization, um, and so on is in some ways more dangerous because it, it nurtures the thirst for revenge. Mm -hmm. And you saw this in, in Serbia where they used in their national, national mythology during the Balkan Wars or the beginning of the, the, beginning of the Balkan Wars, their sort of medieval battles against the Turkish Empire yeah. as a way to justify their extreme violence. And um, uh, the Israelis, in my view, uh, wrongly uh, used the Holocaust far too much in that way. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the Russians and the Chinese, uh, the modern versions of nationalism, based very much on narratives of national being the victims mm -hmm. uh, of others, is, is dangerous for the same reason. And I think Putin's paranoia um, is, is, is deeply rooted in that sense of we're always the victims of the West. Yeah. And, uh, that is the source of perhaps even more violence than uh, the idea of, you know, we won the war and so we're going to be, mm -hmm. continue that sort of... But what they do with that is mobilizing public opinion. Yes. And so maybe then to you, um, like Ian told us how not to do it, <laughs> mm -hmm. but how do you think we should do it to mobilize public opinion? Uh, well, uh, we've produced uh, a number of... Um, <clears throat> materials um, that uh, without uh, any of the kind of vulgarity or the um, manipulation of propaganda <coughs> uh, were uh, compelling uh, narratives and, and uh, efficient narratives of what the European Union does for, the, for you. Uh, Stefan is sitting there in the, uh, on the first row. Uh, it was a kind of little film that kind of showed uh, all the species that were kind of protected uh, through the European Union, all the, uh, uh, all the kind of protection in terms of nature that were uh, initiated by the European Union, all the food security, blah, blah, blah. And all, all of it in, in two minutes gave a totally comprehensive and, and actually overwhelming 
image, uh, and uh, it uh, then the, the punchline was that all of that for less than a kind of yearly uh, subscription to Netflix. And so that is a kind of, it was a very strong statement, but unfortunately we had to make it on our own. We, we, and, and that is one, one of the kind of problems of the European Union. It is essentially incredibly remote. And, uh, Sorry, what do you mean we had to make it on our own? Like there was, you, did, you, yeah, like literally you had to make yeah, it on your own? Literally we had to make it uh, on our own. We, mm -hmm. we had to kind of make it as part of a kind of thing of the Bali mm -hmm. the kind of studio and atelier. But there was never a connection with, uh, and there was never the European Union said, who commissioned, I need this, uh, there's elections, I need uh, four spots that are kind of powerful and yeah. that can tell the whole story and you, uh, we as you and so X, yeah. Y and Z. And, and one of the kind of ironies, and, and this is uh, one of the ways in which the European Union is in, on one hand incredibly impressive uh, and uh, because they want to avoid corruption at uh, all costs. Uh, and, and therefore, everything which is a commission over, I think, 12,000 euro is tendered. Yeah. So basically, they say, you you may make kind of something for us, but uh, if somebody else uh, kind of offers it for a little bit cheaper, then can he gets it, or they get it, or she gets it. So it, it's there is no direct uh, traffic, uh, mm -hmm. I would say, between the kind of the, the bureaucracy of the European Union and some of its kind of strongest kind of supporters uh, in, in the field. It's always with so many compartments you, and so much security uh, in between. Did you offer them the film? Did you say, well, we made it, here you, you yeah, can we, have we it? Offer, we, we offered uh, everything. Yeah. Did they but, use uh, it? But again, I'm not complaining. It's, it's not a complaint, but it's kind of simply, it explains yeah. This this uh, in, in, this scrupulousness on the one hand, but also the inefficiency of developing a strong narrative. But then you made this film before the war. Um, it was would you call it a, a propaganda film for Europe? Yeah. Yeah. Could we still use this propaganda film now with everything we've discussed? Is it, or would you make something else? It was now? a film for the European elections, uh, yeah. so it was uh, basically of its kind. Yeah. We also had a very nice, uh, and this was a kind of studio here for in Bali with uh, Wolfgang Tillmans. We had kind of, for instance, very nice uh, kind of fake uh, film of Angela Merkel apologizing to all the kind of southern countries that uh, Germany had insulted. Uh, and, and so there was a kind of really a wide range of, of actually uh, deeply uh, efficient, uh, effective and, and mm -hmm. strong narratives. But you know, it, 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 it was impossible to, to kind of somehow promote it within the context of Europe. I think yeah. one thing that's very important, if one is going to try and present Europe in, in its best light to a large public, huh? is to try and do something about the popular image of Europe being basically an elite project. Huh? Mm -hmm. And that it's something that's good for people like Rem and me, and we live international lives, and it's convenient to travel all over the place and have the same currency and so on. Large numbers of Europeans who don't have these privileges feel that it's something that's designed to help us, but not them. Mm -hmm. And this is exploited by national politicians all the time. And has the war changed that, you think? Not really. I, no. I, but it's also too no short to, 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 kind of really, to, to really understand it. But I, I think there's, at the same time, Europe is always willing to admit that there's a crisis, but they're kind of very bad at identifying areas where there's no crisis. For instance, there's Erasmus. I'm kind of sure that part of the kind of uh, auditorium is benefiting from uh, Erasmus uh, on a kind of huge way, and, and 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 so therefore it's a complete and unquestioned uh, uh, um, success. Uh, but even there, the European Union is unable to to Pro claim it for itself. To promoting, to, you know, it's to it's, claim it's, it for yeah, itself yeah. or uh, as as a tangible yeah. achievement. True, but the Erasmus is a good example of something that very much benefits people who are highly educated, not necessarily the large number of people who are being manipulated by populists to see Europe as a, an elite mm -hmm. project. It's a bit like in in the United States, where um, liberals in New York and San Francisco find it easy to talk about multiculturalism, immigrants are good for the country. Country, etc., etc., but poor white people in, in Tennessee 
they don't see it that way. Uh, yeah. And, and so you have to do something about um, adjusting that. I mean, I'd be interested to know what Luke thinks, but it, you have to do something about convincing not people like us, or including probably everybody here, but people... Uh, no, but of course we were aware of that uh, divide. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I, I don't think it was all uh, kind of preaching to... Yeah, and I'm not criticizing uh, your film. No, 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 but we, we were, of course, uh, kind of very, very much aware of that. But I think that's also kind of something which I find uh, kind of... Yeah, we will uh, interesting discuss. about Flavia's, yeah. uh, um, Flavia's uh, kind of performance in Switzerland, uh, because she simply uh, uh, questioned whether that divide is kind of really uh, configured the way it is and started to communicate directly to, to uh, about this issue and, and to the so-called class that was uh, inevitably pushed away from the, kind of, from the, from the main thing. I, we will definitely discuss that with Flavia. Luke, my last question is uh, for you because we've talked about Britain and, and, and France and Germany, but then there's of course also Eastern Europe. And um, I'm really curious what your thoughts on if we have to have this, you know, uh, outside story or image, you know, in which we think of uh, geopolitical issues. What then is the role of Eastern Europe? Well, they live a very special moment. In the one hand, on the one hand, a country like Poland is, of course, very worried. Uh, is a frontline state uh, receiving millions of, of, of refugees by a Polish civil society. They feel that they are next door. So they're worried, but at the same time, in a way, they also feel very vindicated vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Western Europe and Paris and, 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 and Berlin and The Hague in the sense that they, they say, well, we spent 10, 20 years warning you against Putin. We told you so, and now you see what happened. So we, we were right all along. And yes. the same for, for, for the Baltic states. And it is, of, of course, not entirely untrue. So you see a kind of shift almost um, within the EU eastward, huh? at the center of, of gravity, uh, those who are driving uh, some of these decisions on sanctions are Eastern European countries. It has been rebalanced a bit, but, but, but still that is a real shift. And of course, with all the uh, decisions ahead on uh, opening up, maybe uh, offering a membership perspective to Ukraine, you will also see almost uh, um, a turn eastward geographically even further now for the European Union. We already lost uh, the UK, very sadly, I agree with Ian, on the Western flanks, meaning that the Netherlands are now, we are now the Western flank, huh, right, of the European Union, which, which is going all the way eastward. So this situation leads to a real rebalancing mm -hmm. between East and Western Europe. But maybe that can also be healing because they feel now more uh, taken seriously and some of the rifts of, of previous crisis moments think about refugees mm. can now be uh, overcome so and and the risk assessment uh, the, the the way we position ourselves how we look at uh, russia china and the us is now more um is, is converging in a way and that that is also a, a very is a precondition in a way to to act jointly so yeah to feel a sense more of unity Exactly. Okay. Well, I really thank you that you joined us. Uh, thank you also for your talk. And also, Ian Burema, thank you so much for joining us. Thank Make you. a round of applause. I would like to invite uh, Flavia Kleiner. She's a Swiss historian and political activist who co-founded Operation Libero, known for its campaigning, it was just said, that has defeated the nationalist and populist agenda of the Swiss, Swiss People's Party in several referenda. And she's also a member of the European Council of Foreign Relations. Flavia, please join us. Um, and, um, Alice Twemlow, she's a professor at the KBK in The Hague and at the University of Amsterdam, and her work is at the intersection of design, history, environmental humanities, literary studies, and artistic research. And she represents the Netherlands in the theme advisory group to redesign the euro for 2021-2024, facilitated by the European Central Bank, uh, Alice. And then... Um, 
like uh, Emmanuel Tiblou to come to the, uh, to, um, to the microphone over here. He's the director of the École Nationale Supérieure des Arts Décoratifs in Paris and co-founder of Eurofabric, or Eurofabric, I don't know. And tonight he will share his insight on imaging new symbols for Europe. Emmanuel. Well, good evening. Um, the, the main challenge for our democracies is to bring back emotions into politics. Dictatorships know very well the political value of aesthetics and emotions. They know how to produce symbols that appeal to emotions. Just think of the swastika or the sickle on the hammer, for instance. The problem our democracies have to face is that our values are not relevant to produce emotionally effective symbols and stories. I mean that our values don't have a big potential in terms of emotivity. Which are our values? They are good and positive values like peace, well-being, happiness, solidarity, fraternity. And it's not easy to create emotional, effective symbols or narratives with those values. As popular wisdom says, happy people have no story to tell. Good feelings won't help you to write good stories. To put it in another way, more concrete, we can say that no symbol will be as effective as that of a nuclear mushroom or barbed wire. This challenge is even more difficult to address at the European scale, insofar as Europe is a recent political construction that aims at bringing together and going beyond centuries old national identities. Paraphrasing Paul Valéry, who considered that European politics didn't live up to its ideas, I would say that European aesthetics didn't live up to its politics. That's the challenge Eurofabric tried to address. So. Yeah. Uh, designed and produced in the framework of the French European Presidency, Eurofabric gathered 400 students coming from 36 European art schools, which worked in pairs, associating a French school and a European school for four days last February in Paris in the Grand Palais Ephemère which is the temporary uh, Grand Palais. Uh, it, uh, it happened before the war. It's important, I think, to uh, have it uh, in, the, in the head. It, um, this, the European project followed the Eurolab project launched in 2018 by Rem Kulas, his associate Stefan Peterman and Wolfgang Tillmans with the aim of changing Europe's image of rebranding Europe. How to integrate and address political issues in terms of artistic practice. And Rem Kulas was one of the guests of Eurofabric. How to link the question of artistic representation to that of political representation. These are the questions which were raised by Eurofabric that was sought as both an agora and a camp to come up with new symbols for European identity. The result is that Eurofabric worked as a barometer of the affects and expectation of today's European creative youth. What was clear from the beginning 
is that this new European identity couldn't be war related as the identity embodied in all symbols as the statue of the Maréchal Joffre that is in the whole of the Grand Palais Ephemère, for instance. One of the main interests of Eurofabric was that it helps us to glimpse the kind of imaginary that according to today's European use, new symbols should have to deal with and embody. For instance, several projects, as this one, use, used sewing or weaving to signify solidarity values. Another project set up by the schools of ANSI Um, by the schools of Ansi and Aquila in Italy, took the form of a mountain shelter, highlighting the importance of protection. Another project from the schools of Toulouse and um, La Casa Encendida in uh, Madrid set out to reactivate the traditional form of the parade which is a very rich way of embody political identity. For their part, Les Beaux-Arts de Paris and the Kunst Academy from Vienna decided to work on the paradoxal figure of the anti-hero, suggesting that there was perhaps a reserve of symbols for Europe. We, we recognize in a yellow Frankenstein, or near Frankenstein, on the, right, on the right part of the screen, Einstein. Einstein, who can be considered as a paradoxal figure insofar as he can be considered as the inventor of nuclear energy, that is what Derrida calls a pharmacon, which is both a poison and a remedy. The schools um, of Strasbourg and Karlsruhe used a mixed media approach, um, hybridizing digital technology and traditional craft by weaving a QR code in a carpet. And several projects were um, like this, hybriding um, new technologies and uh, traditional craft. After this quick panorama, there are two lessons we can learn from Eurofabric. The first one is, uh, sorry, I, I forget, yes, to, to tell one word about this, um, this project, which is from the, um, the school of Caen in Normandy, that decided to reproduce identically placards from protests that take place in uh, ma major European squares. And the lesson we can uh, learn from this project in particular and from Eurofabric in general is first that there is an expectation from Europe that today's European youth expects something from Europe which is nothing less than salvation. And the second lesson is that Europe has to wake up. There is a current following of Europe Fabric, which was taking place yesterday here in Amsterdam, gathering students from two schools that took part in Europe Fabric, the art schools of Breda, St. Jost, and the art school of Rennes in the Brittany in France. The temporary result of this very short workshop of one day is a film that was screened here when we arrived in the room, and that teachers or students who are in the room may be able to talk to us about, to talk to us about later. Thank you. Thank you. Emmanuel. So, um, oh yeah, and um, then maybe you should talk a little bit more in the microphone in the second round. Um, 
Yes, Flavia, to start with you, because um, I heard Emmanuel Tiblou arguing that, and I will paraphrase you, but, um, since values such as peace and solidarity don't appeal to emotions, European democracies fail to produce images that stimulate active, active citizenship. So my first question, Flavia, is very simple. Do you agree? Yeah, well, I think I'm really asking myself if we ha uh, and you mentioned this, uh, Emmanuel, have we tried hard enough to develop uh, democratic imagery for Europe uh, in these peaceful years after the war uh, and prosperous years? And I would say no. <laughs> yeah. And kind of we're inheriting that now on our shoulders as a young generation uh, to create a new uh, imagery that speaks to us, uh, to our hearts, and to our emotions. And honestly, I also think that's uh, that's so important that this that we find an emancipated way of thinking about emotions and politics because it's so negatively connoted. Um, mm -hmm. People think about it as populist, as a propagandist, you know, mm -hmm. emotions. But at the same time, I would say it's really. We are human beings. Uh, we are emotional, uh, you, uh, mm -hmm. you know, human beings, and so we need to be able to also sp speak and interact um, in a language of emotion, in mm -hmm. a way, as citizens. When I was hearing this, Emmanuel, I was thinking, okay, but what about like the pride flag or the black uh, fist of Black Lives Matter of for the peace sign? Like, aren't this you know, kind of democratic symbols that really also appeal to emotions. Well, the, um, the black fight is, um, is a symbol of, um, of, uh, of a fight, of a fight. So, mm -hmm. uh, no, I mean that uh, the problem is that I'm, I'm not sure that we know how to um, think peace, well-being, all those European positive values yeah. as the result of a fight, as something that we have to fight for. There's no emancipation force in it, in these values. It's just... Less, less than in a revolution. Then uh, we, are, we are after the, the revolution. Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, we, we cannot consider that uh, history is over, as uh, Fukuyama said, for mm -hmm. instance, mm -hmm. you know? But, um, but I think that we are not in this moment of uh, fighting for, for freedom, for mm -hmm. instance. Mm -hmm. you know? And there is, um, I think that it's the main challenge to, uh, re, um, to, um, to, 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 to put energy, to put fighting spirits in those values. Yeah. Yes, Flavia, because uh, Rem already mentioned it. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about um, Operation Libero and, mm -hmm. and then especially focusing on the way you maybe used, um, you know, symbols and signs. Yeah, so I'd gladly share some of our insights because uh, at the challenge in Switzerland, just to give a little short context, yeah, was that we have this uh, strong right-wing populist party, uh, which was up to 30% of our um, national parliament. And uh, they dominated mostly the public discourse. And that was the even bigger problem than their representation in parliament. And so it, for us, and we were just a group of young people, we said kind of we want to challenge their um, dominance of the discourse. And we want to use our direct democratic system uh, in Switzerland. Uh, which means we have regularly referendum votes. We wanted to kind of use this tool um, where, yeah, the Swiss population is asked regularly, what do you think? We wanted to use it and say, well, if the Swiss people says, actually, we disagree with you, right-wing populists, then this will be really powerful because then the populists who time and again say, we and only we speak on behalf of the people, when the people says, no, actually, we disagree with you, then this will be uh, a really strong answer. And so um, we didn't only do that, but we also tried to use really um, um, patriotic um, language and patriotic yeah. imagery, you know. And patriotic, I don't mean nationalist. I want to really make this difference. But, but I think... But to use the 
a, a clear difference between yeah. pediatric and natural? So for us, we really refer to our constitution, um, like this founding document of us as a modern nation state. And we said, well, this is what we want to refer to. It's nothing about exclusion of others. It's not about uh, difference between us and others. Um, it's about what unites us and what is the the founding principles of us as a community. And so we time and again refer to these documents and to, um, yeah, we said, for example, the importance of rule of law. How does this matter to every one of us? Why is it worth for us to actually fight for it and defend it? And what is the uh, emancipatory, uh, emancipatory act if we do it, you know, and I think that's what we managed to do with our campaigns. But how did you, because if I hear rule of law and constitution, these are always words that people are like, yeah, but it's not a form of mass communication, you know, yeah, pointing out definitely. these things. How did you made it sexy? Maybe, Mirte, if you allow, allow me to quickly get the pointer, I could Yeah, show yes, sure, it. yeah. Oh, I think they do it ah. for you? I don't know. <laughs> so, yeah, just to start with this, um, this is um, Helvetia. She's the mother um, of the Swiss. She's kind of this allegorical figure, which again, you can find her on our coins here. Uh, and so, yeah, on all the important yeah. books and so on. Yeah. You can just say next slide and then they will ah, do it for you. Okay, yeah. And so again, this is just, that's the, the, the like, that's how the right-wing populists do uh, campaigns in Switzerland. Uh, of course, the, the neutral, white, good sheep huh, kicks out uh, the evil foreigner, the black sheep. Uh, that was basically the one um, campaign that how we, and, and now I'm gonna show you how we countered it. Yeah. That was our imagery. It was with um, Helvetia, the mother of the Swiss. Yeah being um, smashed down with a wrecking ball, which was this one law that they wanted to pass, which was about the expulsion of criminal foreigners for even minor offenses of law. And so basically I can show you this little clip. Uh, I don't know how we, we can launch the video. Maybe you could... Um uh, there should be... Anyhow. Tell us about it. Yeah, it's just important to, to show, like, again, these values, as you asked, mm -hmm. Mirta, how, how do they actually matter to us and why, do they, um, why they are they of importance to us? And we could basically show by uh, explaining this law to the people um, that, you know, every one of us would, in, if he, he, would, he or she would be in front of a judge, for example, mm -hmm. be seen as an, an individual. He would want to feel uh, a judge to um, you know, um, how do you say to wait? Uh, yeah, to wait up uh, individual um, hard cases of hardship and so on. We wanted to illustrate this because all of a sudden everybody could kind of familiarize and understand um, why rule of law and then uh, this this uh, space for a judge to to weight up different arguments, mm -hmm. why this is so important. And, and so all of a sudden people realized, right, if I would be the one who would be driving two times too fast, um, I would want the judge to see me as an individual, to see me having a family in this country, to see me, um, yeah. And yeah. so this was, yeah, speaking to people. And then we did many different campaigns um, yeah. on different subjects. Again, here you can see a really, uh, uh, historical argument we did of the oath of the three founding fathers of Switzerland. And we wanted to kind of underline the fact that when we give, when we shake hands, we hold the word kind of, and we stick to it. And again, that's a really, I would say, you know, classical way to argue and the really, uh, yeah, be strong, holy word and so on. But people could understand this and they would ap appeal to it. And I yeah. think that's, well, I think it's also uh, some way very um, promising to see that that sometimes people just think that everything has to be made, what I just said, sexy or fun, but mm -hmm. you, you know, you really took the essentials mm -hmm. and it worked. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm then, um, Rem, I'm curious in the, the projects uh, you did, uh, for example, how did you thought about, um, because also what Ian said, like you have that Europe is this elitist project, 
how did you think of um, communicating with like a larger group? Uh, well, I, I what I refer to uh, kind of simply say that we did a number of things. Uh, the things were you know, kind of some that was kind of almost similar. Uh, we also made posters. We also it it, it was a kind of you know that we, as Europeans we were both skeptical and self-critical and. Uh, and I, I really admire the directness of uh, uh, this work, uh, particularly. And so in certain ways, we, we also uh, try to be equally direct and, and equally um, unpretentious. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and Flavia was uh, there, by the way, uh, kind of also inspiring us. So, but but uh, otherwise, let's, let's benefit more from the kind of people on the table. Huh? <laughs> Yeah. We will. Mm -hmm. Then, um, Alice, let's go to you. Um, so, as I already said, you are highly involved in the e EBC project, the redesign of the new Your Notes. Can you tell us a little bit more about this project? Yeah, sure. Um, firstly, I apologize for my British accent. It's uh, <laughs> let's just put that aside right now. Um, yeah, well, it's a very, I really appreciate your description, Rem, of the uh, European kind of system of being the scrupulous inefficient, inefficiency. Mm. I'm experiencing this firsthand, and it's both incredibly, uh, as you said, um, admirable, but also challenging yeah. uh, to, na to, na to navigate. So we're in a very complex process where each of the uh, member states has a representative, and we meet uh, in a sort of bigger version of this to try and figure out a theme um, that is both acceptable, <laughs> inclusive, um, but also really trying to establish that emotional connection that's come up a yeah. lot today. Um, that then, uh, well, if we could all agree on that, and believe me, there's already some tussles going on around the table, uh, really interesting ones. Um, if we can agree on that, we present it to the uh, European Central Bank, who then presents it to the public for, for um, some input. Somehow then we turn it into a design brief, mm -hmm. and then the, the tendering happens that, that, that you spoke of. Absolute chaos, I, I can um, mm. ima mm. imagine, you know, in, in some respects. But then in other respects, like you said, it's incredibly carefully monitored, and there's good reasons behind all of these steps. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, I mean, I, yeah, so that's the process. But can you, because, it, I mean, um, the notes were already discussed, like now, I realized I never looked at the notes. Ah, mm, yes, well. So it, there are like uh, fantasized bridges as I uh, like on it, I've heard. Yeah, I think you can kind of see how they ended up with it, right? Because I mean, there's nothing bad per se with the idea of trying to communicate these values, right? We, we talk about, we, when we too are ending up in this kind of bit of a swamp of the virtue of the European values, <laughs> yeah. you, you get stuck in it, right? Um, so, you know, you could see how they ended up with that, and it's, I think, I think basically, though, everyone feels they're fine, but they're a little bland, and we want to try and create something with more emotional connection this time. But listen, I, I'm learning so much about, about Europe, European Union, and, and, and currency through this project, and the big thing I really want to try and bring to the fore is mm. that when we've talked about Europe as a map, as an identity, as a cult, all these things, it, we have to remember it's going to undergo vast changes in the next 20 years. By the time these notes are out, yeah. one billion um, of the global population is going to be on the move um, from water stress. Um, you know, Europe is going to, um, I think the notes offer, offer us an opportunity, even though many of us don't use cash right now, they offer us opportunity to signal to a future population of Europe, welcome. And do you really think that the image of a note can have such power? Well, yeah, I mean, there are 30 billion of them in circulation. Mm -hmm. So that's a pretty good public service announcement, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And you know what? I was thinking <laughs> graphic designers are like, yeah, I could get into that. Um, <laughs> and uh, I was thinking of, of, of your work, Flavia, and just this idea of the tools that you're highlighting and identifying, you know, even if we could get that mm. on the note, right? 
This is, this is the secret code. This is how. Mm -hmm. What do you mean with the tools? Um, the tools of representation uh, and just the, I mean, the way Flavia describes it, what I love is the simplicity of it, you know, mm -hmm. and, and just the, the power. You group together, mm -hmm. you form a strong image, you believe in something, and you follow the code of the law. Mm -hmm. So you described uh, a little bit to us how difficult this uh, process is. And is this because of European bureaucracy or is it also because you are dealing you know, with all these different nation states, with all these different identities? No, I think, I think the nation states, I think that's all clear. That, that's left outside the room. You know, mm -hmm. I, I don't think, you know, I think everyone knows what the, the, the brief is. We're, we're, we're all really identify strongly with Europe. Mm -hmm. No, no, the, the, the debates are happening around things like, um, well, how do you create emotional connection? Um, that generally leads one, okay, to faces and eyes. Okay, faces and eyes then sometimes lead one to famous white men of Europe, you know. And, and this is and this is the issue. And then we get into the um, notion of inclusivity. So that's the tussle that's mm -hmm. happening. Um, will there? Do you think there will be people on the notes? Oh, I can't see at this moment. Literally, we have 31 um, uh, proposals um, in circulation at the moment. Um, so we're whittling it down. Um, maybe, yeah. Um, but it will be done with great care. That everyone. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you get that? Um, no, we're all. There's, I will. We have little microphones like this at our tables, and you have to press. I will be making some comments if, if it goes the way. And, and do you agree with Emmanuel that it's very difficult to create symbols that have like an emotional connection to democratic values? Well, yeah, but it sort of depends what, what way you look at it. I mean, I think there's a bunch of people in Europe and about to come to Europe who are fighting, fighting like crazy. Mm. You know, so I mean, there's mm -hmm. some of us that have, have the luxury of not, but yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to build on that because I really think, speaking of this mm -hmm. crisis in Ukraine, I think what we said, it, the Europe lacks of having, you know, paid into this talos of yeah, liberal democracy mm -hmm. um, strong enough or confident enough, even though it was living it, you know. But also, as Luc van Midlau mentioned, it was really this pragmatic language of, yeah, uh, we're building institutions and money and, you know, economic reforms and so. Um, and I think really this crisis now can be kind of an unforeseen <laughs> anti talos just coming into our lives mm. because especially now, I mean, it's not the first war again since the Second World War on Europe, on the continent, yeah. but it's the first in this mediatized uh, age, you know, so I think all of us just see the war and see this anti-telos, this different thing of democracy that is happening now in Europe. And we see it on our, like every day, on our smartphones everywhere. And I think that can be a really powerful story because we all just realize we don't want to, uh, to flee our countries. We don't want our village in ruins. And you don't have to live in a... But, yeah. Flavia, I also just meant on a super basic level as well, just within yeah. our daily lives yeah. as women, as, as, as we've been discussing mm -hmm. before, as anyone yeah. who, who feels there's still many, many injustices in place mm -hmm. to, to uphold those European values for. Mm -hmm. So if you just switch it around a bit, and, and I loved it that in, in those projects you were showing us with those... Um, those replicas of the placard posters, mm. that's when I kind of really mm. sat up. Mm. They're so powerful, yep. right? And, and the, there is, and so there is that spirit there. And, um, and the question is how to, you know, is how to do something that allows for that to manifest for the future. Um, and yeah. What did you experience, Emmanuel, with the, with the projects? Because they are like very bottom up. Uh, and you're bringing all these young people, mostly, together. Um, what happened? Did it unify them? Did it divide them? What, what did you see happening? Well, I think that what was very uh, interesting is that it was the opposite of the banknote, for instance. I mean that the, the banknote is, um, 
It, the, the problem with the banknote is the problem with uh, democracy. I mean that it's a consensus. The result is a consensus. Yeah. And if, if, there is, if there are bridges on banknotes, mm -hmm. it's because we cannot agree uh, <laughs> to choose another, uh, another picture, another uh, figure. Yeah. And um, that's a big problem. And with, um, in Eurofabric, there was... We, we, the, the, there was not such uh, such problem and such a consensus. You didn't aim for a consensus, uh, no. no. No, and uh, no, we we have to, we have we need a consensus, but uh, consensus is always uh, a problem, and it's a problem specifically um, when you are speaking about uh, symbols or about uh, patterns or about figures, because you have to make a choice. You ma you have to make a strong choice, and. Uh, and the consensus is the opposite of the, of the choice. And on the other hand, I think that what we need, and maybe we approached this with uh, Eurofabric, what we need is a uh, ambic Europe is uh, so um, divided, is so complex, is so, um, that so many uh, nations, mm -hmm. so many identities that we have to to, to create symbols, symbols, ambiguous symbols. And it's very difficult to conciliate um, mm -hmm. ambiv ambivalence or, yeah. and, uh, and symbol. And uh, for instance, I'm thinking about this, uh, you know, this famous pattern, you can, um, you can see uh, a duck or you can see a rabbit. Yeah, it's just That's, the way you look I, at it. You, you, yeah. you see, yeah. you see this pattern. So I think that we need this kind of pattern for Europe. Yeah. That's an interesting. <laughs> Duck or rabbit? I'll make a note of that and bring <laughs> it. <to the> committee. <laughs> no, but I just I want to maybe Rem is good to bring in here as well at this moment because I worry that we're talking too much about symbols as being things that transmit meaning. Mm -hmm. and transmit values, right? And that brings us back to the elitist project idea. And that maybe that just will never work in that way, mm -hmm. whereas, whereas symbols can be things that allow for meaning to manifest mm -hmm. and to grow over time. Can you and give a, an example? Well, I don't know. I'm just thinking maybe, it, yeah, maybe, maybe the, the, we have to allow for some room for surprise and and space and I, I that sounds super vague and how do we do that on a banknote but do you know what I mean come on Ram I'm so curious Ram how you struggled with all these uh, issues uh, uh, basically uh, kind of probably before uh, you never experienced it but the Dutch had uh, their own money and uh, they also had their own uh, designed money and the money was unbelievably cheerfully designed and it became uh, kind of almost a competition between different uh, typographers and uh, it was purple pink kind of very explicit and outspoken and uh, the one thing it did uh, it convinced every dutchman that uh, we were a modern nation mm -hmm. and uh, so in, in that sense it was not necessarily about uh, a symbol of uh, dutchness but it was simply the practice of being modern being extravagant with money uh, and and being basically creating something festive, mm. and and I think the the the, 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 the charge of inventing symbols, finding the, the right symbols, is also counterintuitive to, in terms of being festive uh, and 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 cheerful and uh, and and basically almost I, I would. I have a plead for frivol a degree of frivolity in, in the kind of very European uh, kind of atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And you'll be pleased yeah. to hear, Em, I brought this Oxenar's designs yeah. for the Gilders yeah. to the table, to mm -hmm. this uh, table. Um, well, what did they say? Well, they loved it. The, the one, I mean, you know, mm -hmm. they brought out their own. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, we didn't. Um, no, but I mean, I think it was incredible, like the one like the snipe, for example, the water snipe. Um, that denomination, I think it was, uh, was it the 20? I'm thinking. Um, but anyway, that became just known as the snipe, yeah. um, the 100 Gilder. And um, 
that, that it became so, uh, yeah, identity. And, and I, that must have taken everyone by surprise, I think. I don't think people were that inter interested in snipes necessarily beforehand. Mm. Um, but, but these things can happen. And what you say then also about this sort of um, sense of being modern as well, I think we, we all have to look as well to the Norwegian notes, which uh, produced by, uh, mm. partially produced by an architecture firm, um, uh, Snohetta, which 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 I definitely think lead the way in some respects. I haven't seen them. Why uh, is no. it? Well, just that, that they've taken the sea as the theme, but they they manage to use the real estate of the the note very nicely in that they're using the front for a more representational image of the sea, and the back uh, side is is all pixelated um, and very sort of impressionistic, but it. it it, uh, in line with what um, Rem is saying, it gives a kind of sense of um, an aesthetic statement, mm. which I guess is what you're saying as well, making a choice. But I was thinking, do you think we should be more like literally or more kind of, you know, s uh, creating a sense of? Yeah. It's just a thought building on this mm. and also on the deep the discussion we had before, you know, we were speaking about Europe in the world and what it's, its position and how is this perceived and the image of this. And sometimes I think maybe we're just overcharging yeah, yeah. Europe yeah. with everything and we as citizens have to understand everything from one symbol and, you know, it's just a mission totally impossible. And maybe um, we just have to start slicing these different interests or like expectations, because I think one thing is really, and now I also look forward to European elections in mm. not so many years from now, mm. um, how can we create a, a strong or emotional relationship between yeah. citizens yeah. and the European project? Yeah, um, that, that's one layer. And to me, this doesn't, I think, this doesn't have to be the same, like, okay, what is the geopolitical future of Europe in the world? You know, I, I just think it's a bit too many um, yeah. questions. Yeah, I, I was, uh, because I was thinking really this as my uh, last question for you, and you can procrastinate a little bit on it because I first will go to the audience. But yeah, really my mm. question for you all is with the new European elections coming up, if you were asked by the EU com you know, com uh, communication team, you know, what would be your advice. So you don't have to answer it now. Uh, please think of it a bit. And now I really would like uh, to give the floor to the audience and see whether there are questions. Yeah, there's a question. Hello, my name is Louis. I'm the French ambassador here to the Netherlands, and I'm really glad uh, to have you uh, around the table. Hello, Rem, and I don't know if Luke is still online, but uh, in any case, hello to him. Um, in a way, I think what we are trying to overcome when we look at representations is, uh, I was thinking about it by listening to the very elegant remark by our uh, UK, British, English friend about the accent, we are trying to overcome the, the barrier of language, which is obviously uh, the problem. And, uh, and in a way, we don't have the privilege to, be, to have been raised in English. And hence, we need to struggle. Of course, the Dutch struggle a little bit less than the others, but we still need to struggle um, using a foreign language when we want to communicate with one another, which is, of course, a huge barrier for the circulation of ideas. And that's why, I guess, the question of iconography is, of course, important because it overcomes, in a way, the barriers uh, issue. Um, I still think we need to remain mindful of the uh, language issue because it's, it's, it really um, precludes uh, the functioning of the ideas debate in Europe. Um, and it also means that when we look at each other, uh, since we are talking about representations, we more often than not look at each other through the lenses of others. Uh, when the French read about the Netherlands, most of the time it's in the New York Times or in the Financial Times. When the Dutch read about France, it's most of the time through the New York Times or the Financial Times. And that means that there is a huge distortion, of course, in the way we look at each other, because we are not able to look at each other directly, in a way. Or we need a kind of several mirrors uh, to be able to interact with one another, or, or the interface of external actors that either have a distorted view of Europe, I would 
but maybe the Financial Times in that category, or, or, or even frankly sometimes more and more a hostile view of Europe, and I would, but in some instances the New York Times in that category. We had that problem as France, for example, after the Samuel Paty assassination, where we were frankly under a huge press aggression from the American uh, press. I think in the Dutch press I ended up saying uh, that we would not change our way of, our way of lives um, because um, journalists in Brooklyn would like to. Uh, and in a sense, because the event was so big, we got some attention from the Dutch press directly th this time. And I have to say that the, the way we were portrayed was much more subtle and to the point because we, we since we, we are in fact neighbors, we, we tend to each other to understand each other in fact better than when we look at each other through external lenses. Okay. So, so my we... point, my question <laughs> is, is it not time for us to decolonize ourselves, mm. become more autonomous when it comes to the construction of our own identity as Europeans? I was really struck by the point you made about the flags because the two flags you mentioned, and, I, and it's not a judgment on the value of the cause, these are great causes, but the two flags you mentioned were actually created in the United States. The rainbow flag in San Francisco in 78, and I'm not sure, but I guess that the Black Lives Matter flag also was created in, in the United States. And so when you mentioned two flags for Europe, you mentioned actually two US uh, built flags, which I find in itself extremely uh, interesting. And then I just have a request. If you find any French person that thinks uh, that we rule the world, I would like really very much to be introduced <laughs> to him or her, because I don't know any. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm very uh, curious about the issue of language. I find it uh, very interesting. Who would like to uh, comment on that? Yeah, I think it's really interesting. Although I'm a little... Well, one of the themes um, I'm quite interested in is the endurance of um, folklore, folk tales, myths, legends, this kind of thing, and the extent to which that can create a link between a, a very ancient past, actually, and, and the reinterpretation, as we can see right now, uh, with um, Sleeping Beauty in the metaverse, you know, it's, it's happening right now. So, um, I, and I was thinking that would be a way to address language, actually, um, and also to address kind of things in terms of regions. Um, Obviously, you know, you have Catalan uh, folktales, you have Slavic, you have Baltic, et cetera, which is a good way in. Um, and I do think the notes can perform a, a sort of function as a kind of mode of heritage preservation in that sense of, of certain languages that are under threat. And I do think there have been some incredible things done, for example, with the Sami language and things like this, which could be addressed on the notes. Um, so you but, actually want to highlight the differences in language more than kind of find is uniform. I think there might be a way to, to su suggest as, you know, I, go, I can't put points on anything specific, but I think it can be addressed through, um, through a larger theme like that. Mm -hmm. But I, I also like the point um, the French ambassador is making about um, just to remind ourselves of the power of visual imagery, you know, in all of this, of, the, of iconography as a, as a means for stimulating debate in whatever language that is. Uh, Emmanuel, how do you uh, do you experience that we are reading about each other's countries through the uh, Anglo-Saxon press? Do you think that's a problem? I think the problem uh, is, the, um, is the, um, the the monopole of the English uh, language. As you can um, note, my English is not uh, very well, very good, and. Um, uh, and how, how did it uh, happen? When I was, no, 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 because, hey, no. I really want to know, yeah. I, I, no, no, because, no, it's not, it, it doesn't, um, it's not only a, a private uh, story, I think. Because I, um, no, at the beginning, I was uh, speaking very well uh, English, and then I've been uh, living for six or seven years in, uh, in Spain. Y empezó a hablar muy bien español. Y pues todas las palabras me venían en castellano y podía hablar. Y al principio no hablaba nada de español. Y, y luego volvió a Francia. Y ahora j'arrive en France, je reviens en France. Y là, il a été très difficile de revenir al inglés. 
So I think that a good symbol for, um, for Europe could be this, could be, for instance, maybe it's not, uh, it's not an image, maybe it's not a picture, maybe it's a text, maybe it's narrative, because the, um, the power of the narrative is that it uh, embodies time, it embodies duration, and, uh, and it embodies transformation, the process. And it's very difficult to um, embody the idea of process in an image, and Europe, is a process. Mm. I think today Europe is still a process on what we need for Europe maybe is more narratives than pictures mm. or symbols. And maybe one of the best symbols for Europe could be a book like uh, Ulysses from Joyce. I mean a book that, uh, that speaks all the languages, all the, the languages that are currently spoken and all the languages of the past mm. on all the languages of the future. But it's something like that. It's more a narrative than an image. That's an interesting point. I was almost thinking we have to go back to the Esperanza uh, yes. language, you know, as a, as a whole European continent. Um, yeah, Flavia, what would you like to comment on this? Uh, for me, when you asked before um, what would be in regard of the European elections, um, maybe our image or what we would build on, for me, but be maybe to see Europe as a, a friend, the European Union as a friend, um, because a friend is someone who, you know, you choose that person. If you're not just like your brother or sister, um, you happen to be born in that family and you have to be with him together in a way, but you can really uh, rely on this friend. You can build on him. He makes sure that you have a warm meal to eat. And to me, maybe, that would be a, a nice and warm um, idea of um, an emotional idea of what Europe could be. And I also read this really um, beautiful poem, again, something really um, intellectual maybe, but by Goethe. But I want to say it, it ends with a really beautiful phrase. It's his Osterspaziergang, um, so the, the walk on Easter, it's called. And it says at the end, the very last phrase is, here bin ich Mensch, here darf ich sein. Which means kind of, here I am a human, be human being and here I am allowed to be. And to me, this is what I wish every citizen to feel when he mm -hmm. is in Europe or she is in Europe. And that he knows that there is, uh, you know, a minister fighting for his rights out there in the world, uh, in the geopolitical games, you know. but that in his everyday life he feels safe and uh, seen and respected in his yeah, being. Okay, so we have Goethe and you, you, you see mm -hmm. Ulysses, so I'm, um, yes. you're still a little bit in the elitist. Um, um, mm. <laughs> but not so <laughs> much, I want to, it's of course this, this phrase, but what I mean as a substance. Of no, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Is there, uh, before I also go to you with, you know, what your advice would be, is there another question in the audience? Yeah, two actually. So uh, right behind you. Um, yeah, so on average uh, week they actually speak 3.5 languages a day, but it's still not the thing that I consider the most divisive in Europe and the European Union. Actually, what I think uh, de deserves more attention is what was a little bit discussed in the first segment, and that is like looking more inwards, because we tend to speak of ourselves as us versus them, and them is always outside of the European Union. But within it, we also divide, and we, had, we said, Eastern Europe versus Western Europe, and usually divided by what used to be a line, what used to be a curtain. Some of us who grew up in Central Europe, we like to say, <laughs> discuss this and also do not refer to Western, Eastern, but East Bloc, uh, more likely. But, and we try to seek for all these ways how to unify, and whether there's a banknote, because we really enjoy pretty things, and we want to channel emotions through design, but actually we try to speak for others, right, when we try to design for them. So perhaps a blank white piece of paper with a number on it, right? Exactly. But, um, and we try to think like, oh, what's the best propaganda message, right? So we go into the marketing world from the politics world, really. And actually, if I remember correctly, there was a pretty solid foundation, I believe, and it was called uh, United in Diversity. <laughs> and I wonder why it was not mentioned today, considering that uh, was one of the things that the European Union really was putting out there, so. Maybe yeah. a prompt for some reactions. 
Yes, united in diversity. Yeah. Why did it did it appeal to you? Did it did it do its work? Mm -hmm. Well, sorry, this is a bit left field, but it kind of relates. Um, I like to think about Europe, and this could be from a position of privilege, so I apologize, but it's just where I am right now, thinking about it more in terms of biomes, and you know, to think of it more about tundra and wetlands and boreal forests and these things, these are things that will, we need a relationship with in order for this to survive as, we, as we're going forward. So um, that's what just another way of kind of, of thinking through beyond um, countries and regions and, and so forth. Um, I forgot the other thing I was going to say. Oh, about the um, diversity. Yeah, just the other thing, it was mentioned earlier, you know, the incredible pioneering work the EU has done in terms of species conservation. That's biodiversity rather than diversity, but it's all part of it. It is amazing. And it's ambition in that respect. I mean, if we need something to celebrate and get hopeful about, I really, I think it's pretty, pretty good. So we should get away more of culture and values and no, more no, focus get away. on... We're all in it together. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe focus more on, 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 on ecosystems and nature. Use it as a way maybe to tell the narratives of migration, for example. Yeah. Does this answer your question? No, I, was, no, I saw I your like face. Yeah. <laughs> maybe not, uh, not an answer, but a few words. Um, I think that uh, what, you, what you point is the question of uh, universalism. And uh, Europe, is, uh, Europe is a cradle of uh, universalism. And we can consider that nowadays we have to face a crisis of universalism. And what is universalism? Universal, u universalism is a way to uh, produce unity from diversity. That's what means univers, universe at the opposite of diversity. And uh, this, nowadays, it's, uh, it's, it's a problem, it's a crisis. And I think what is fascinating with Europe is that considering that Europe is the cradle of the universalism, we can consider that Europe is, is a crisis. The Europe is the name of, of our crisis. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very difficult, but it's also a chance to, uh, to be part of the crisis. <coughs> Europe is a crisis, you say. Yeah, yes, I'm just processing no, it. No, what, what I mean is that, uh, well, how can we, uh, how can we define, uh, what can be a good definition for the, the crisis? It, uh, it's more or less what um, the Italian philosopher uh, named Gramsci said about the crisis. He says that uh, there is crisis when there is a conflict between an old world that cannot die mm -hmm. and a new world that cannot born, that cannot mm -hmm. uh, appear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and Europe is this place. Europe is this place where there is still an old world and there is a new world who tries to, uh, to come, who tries to uh, arrive. And uh, universalism uh, belongs to the old world. Mm -hmm. Clear. Another question. Yes, uh, upstairs. Yeah. Thank you. Good evening. Um, it was mentioned before that uh, the person on the left, I'm sorry, I don't remember your name, the one designing the banknotes, um, <laughs> you were saying that um, you were thinking 20 years ahead in terms of uh, new populations coming to Europe. Um, and that you could want to um, kind of use that story to put on the bill. Well, first of all, I'd like to like know what, where you'd be going with this. And kind of my follow-up, depending on your first answer, of course, would be you've mentioned the uh, elitist character of the European Union. Um, it's already, it seems hard to me to talk to your neighbors already. So if you start talking to people outside of Europe, um, don't you think that you're going to face a certain backlash with that? Thank you. Uh, okay. Um... Uh, I don't have much more to add, really. Uh, maybe someone else can respond. But no, I, I don't think it's about talking to people outside Europe. I'm just saying that we have to try and use our imaginations about the kind of... Um, I mean, just even the outline of Europe <laughs> is going to change. 
right? I mean, the, someone said the map, the outline. Well, that will change. Um, and with a with a 1.5 degree uh, rise in temperature, um, the pressure on water around the globe will be such that, yeah, I, you know, I don't know exactly which populations will be arriving, but it's going to be it's going to be horrific in one sense that people are being uprooted from their homes, but it's everything European st uh, values stand for, is, is to welcome them. And so, no, I don't know how to put that on a banknote, but all I know is I have to think of them uh, in, in the processes of discussions of the people who will be using them. So, that's all. Sorry, maybe someone else. Can... I think we are more questions or may, maybe I can use the, the this kind of moment to announce that there will be very soon a European review of books uh, that is uh, kind of basically kind of recognizing the multiplicity of languages that are being spoken in uh, in Europe and that will basically publish uh, different writers uh, translate them not necessarily always in French, in uh, English, but also sometimes in German and French, or even uh, kind of Chinese. And that there is therefore a kind of really uh, considerable energy being put into uh, thinking beyond the kind of Anglo-Saxon uh, kind of language sphere. Nothing. Yes, so maybe I think last question there. Um... It's based in Maastricht. I had a bit of a question, is it not a symbol that is the problem? Because like, as if we can, like within one symbol, explain what it is, if you can never ever be uh, properly in Europe, uh, shouldn't we make like European places, like a European library or a re European school, or everyone that comes new starts being in Europe, rather being in the national space? Because that's also, you say that Europe is in crisis, but I think nationalities are in crisis. And Europe cannot be in crisis because it doesn't physically feel existing. And I think that's a bit where the problem is. Would, would someone like to respond? It's, I don't know if it's a question or a remark, right? The symbol is not the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it would be very interesting if a few of us uh, would make a commitment to not necessarily a, a kind of session like this one, but to a performance where we talk uh, in uh, two hours uh, exclusively uh, in incredibly euphoric terms about Europe, uh, where we sketch uh, irresponsible perspectives uh, with great conviction and where we uh, simply make a commitment to avoid the word crisis. Because I think it, 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 it should not always end in this uh, kind of position or in this moment. And I think there's kind of many, many, many kind of reasons to be much more optimistic mm -hmm. about uh, uh, Europe than we ever allow ourselves to, to be. Well, I think that our great last words for this session. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not... A performance. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to start about the crisis again. I think you made an excellent point and maybe also a, a hopeful point. I think uh, we, we never had this idea that we would come with a, a clear-cut conclusion. It was more very interesting to hear all your thoughts on this. I really would like to thank you all for this conversation. Of course, also Ian Burema and Luc van Middelaar. And thank you for your concentration. And maybe we can talk a bit more at the bar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.